Okay, and joining me today is John Rogers, and I'm very excited to be talking to John, uh, and we're going to be talking about um, basically four, well, a very hot topic at the moment, I think, uh, which is spaced, uh, distributed, and uh, interleaved practice, and the differences between those, which we'll get into. But uh, so thanks very much for coming uh, to talk to me today, John. Oh, happy to be here. And um, as always at the start, would you mind uh, just briefly introducing yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, my name is John Rogers. I am a faculty member here in Hong Kong at the Education University of Hong Kong. Uh, most people know Hong Kong University, and this is a separate institution, and it's uh, primarily a teacher training institution. So uh, I, my background is I have a long history, a long history, my background is I have uh, I've been teaching EFL for a number of years before I came to Hong Kong, uh, and here I teach courses on second language acquisition, uh, second language pedagogy, and so on. Uh, previously, I had taught in the Middle East, so I was in Qatar for a number of years, uh, teaching in a foundation program there, and also working in administration. And prior to that, I was in the Czech Republic also for a number of years. Uh, and that's where I where I first started teaching, where I did my initial teacher training qualification, uh, and then the Delta. And uh, while I was there, I also was at the New School, where I did my master's degree. Uh, I think I was in the first cohort that went through the New School, actually, with wow. um, Scott Thornbury and so on. So Scott Thornbury was your teacher at that time? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I suppose Carol Leatherby was there at the time, wasn't she? Uh, I think she might have been co-teaching. Uh, okay. It's been a while. So uh, I think she might have been co-teaching with Jeremy Harmer on a course. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's quite yeah, possible. Yeah. That's quite yeah. possible. Wow, small uh, work, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And then, um, and then I moved to Qatar from the Czech Republic, and I got more interested in research at that time. And while I was working in Qatar, I did my PhD part-time at University College London. Um, so my background... Uh, started out more language teaching and over the years I've transitioned into more research focus. Uh, but still, uh, I, I like to think I'm true to my roots to some degree, uh, yeah. you know, where, yeah, where I try to keep my research at least somewhat relevant for language teaching. It's a common, uh, it's a common route. Hmm. It's a common route. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you did a Delta, but I mean, I'm detecting from your accent some somewhere in North America, but you did a Delta. Yes. Yeah. So originally from North Carolina, um, okay. And, uh, you know, that's where I did my undergraduate degree. After I finished the undergraduate degree, I think like uh, a lot of like many teachers, I uh, moved abroad, basically started teaching as a way to fund my travels. Uh, and then, you know, like many of us, uh, it became a career uh, right. and I became more interested in it over time. Um, and I have I have lost my uh, southern accent to some degree. You'll, you'll hear it pop up when I in my R's maybe. But uh, yeah. If you work in ELT long enough, you end up with a strange accent. Um, anyway, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, so <clears throat> spacing. Um, so the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is when we were writing the book, we were looking at concepts from cognitive psychology and uh, effective teaching methods from cognitive psychology. And one of the ones that we looked at was um, spacing versus massing. And obviously for vocab, there was quite a lot of kind of encouraging research and, and actually the original um, the original research done by cognitive psychologists often uses um, foreign language or, or, or fake, sometimes fake foreign languages, sometimes kind of very obscure foreign languages to do the research. And, and I think it's, there's quite a lot of um, support for it in um, ELT. We're going to talk about that later. Um, but then we started looking at grammar teaching and massing and spacing, and it got very complicated very quickly. And so one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today was hopefully to try to unravel some of this. It's, um, it's a very kind of, considering the, the amount of research there is in cognitive psychology, it's kind of newish, it seems to me, in ELT, particularly the grammar focus. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, it might be useful to define for people um, who are watching the difference between the four, and there, are, there are actually more, I think, uh, but I don't want to get too confusing, the four conditions, and that is blocked, massed, spaced, and interleaved. Is that, have I got that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So I think... Uh... 
I'll do my usual preamble, and I'm going to assume the listeners aren't familiar. So, um, yeah, humor me, uh, right. those of you at home who are. So spacing research, people typically begin by discussing uh, a German psychologist called Ebbinghaus, right. um, who's considered the father of memory research. And this was back in the late 19th century, so it's more than 130 years ago. Ebbinghaus wasn't the only one. There was also another researcher named Jost, who also did similar research around the same time. But Ebbinghaus, um, so he has a famous publication where he did a series of studies on himself. So it was a self-study. Right. And you mentioned earlier the, the made-up words. Um, one of the things he, one of the studies, he looked at nonsense syllables. So nonce words like Jev, Dal, Zam, and so on. And he was looking at um, when he had a string of these, how long would it take him to memorize the order? And he did this over multiple uh, multiple repetitions and multiple orders over a long period of time. And one of the experiments looked at uh, or compared when he uh, basically went through the order, similar to like flashcard learning, right. how many repetitions would it take for him to memorize the order if he did the studying just in one single intensive study session versus when he broke up the study over a longer period of time. So studied for a while, then took a break, came back, studied more, took a break, and so on. And what he found was when he broke up the study over longer periods of time, he was able to memorize the lists in far fewer numbers of repetitions. Right, right. So in effect, uh, in terms of just measuring the, the time it took, uh, perhaps it was more, uh, it was quicker when he did it in a masked setting but the number of repetitions, it was more efficient when he spread it out over a longer period of time. So he was able to learn it in effect uh, more quickly uh, and retain the information for longer uh, with these gaps. So the first condition where he studied it in an intensive single training condition, that's what we call MAST. So when we see the word MAST, um, in its essence, it should be no break. So a single intensive period of study, not breaking it up. Right. In, in research, though, sometimes uh, it is operationalized differently. Like you will see like maybe a small break uh, okay. in, the order, in the order of minutes. Uh, it depends on the actual research study, but it, it should be very intense with no break. Mask. Right. Uh, spaced or distributed refers to when we have these breaks. Right. So we study a while, we have a break, and then we come back and study more. Uh, so would that be, for example, I would do 10 minutes of, let's say I'm learning five uh, vocab items. I do 10 minutes, I take a five minute break. I do 10 minutes and I take a, another five minute break. That would be spaced? That would be spaced, yes. And, and mass would be just 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, back to back with no break. Yes, yeah. So just 30 minutes of study. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Later on, we'll talk about when we talk about the research, uh, we'll talk about how the research studies that have investigated this have actually been designed, right. because I think this this comes into the discussion of whether or not it uh, all of the literature from cognitive psychology, whether it generalizes to second language learning. Um, uh, and you this also mentioned this is something you've written about in particular, I think, in 2017 um, about the problems with the transfer of some of that literature. Yes, yeah, and I'm and I'm also working on a uh, a book now and discussing oh, okay. this in more detail. So yeah, I'll, I'll plug that later on, but Good still news. to be written. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, and you also mentioned blocked versus interleaved. Uh, this is a variant of spacing, um, and uh, so assuming the audience members are foreign language teachers, uh, to illustrate this, so imagine like a teacher is making a worksheet to practice past simple versus present perfect. And for the sake of simplicity, this worksheet's going to have 10, 10 fill, in the, fill in the blank where they have to write the verb in the correct form, whether past simple or present perfect. So they have to look at the context, the sentence, and decide. Uh, and let's imagine there's going to be five past simple and five present perfect. So the question becomes, how should we design the worksheet uh, for the students? Mm -hmm. One way to do it is we could have questions one to five could all be where past simple is the correct answer. And then questions six to 10 are the present perfect. So this would be 
an example of blocked because the the category the questions in terms of the category of the correct answer are arranged in blocks five past simple versus five present perfect or we could mix them up and uh, mixing them up it could just be every other it just switches one past simple one present perfect or it could just be completely randomized this would be interleaved so like mixed up together right so block uh, is like a a a a b b b b and interleaving is a b a b a b kind of thing for example yes yeah. yes yeah um and uh and you could have more categories of course so you could have a a a b b b c c c blocked versus a b c a b c a b c interleaved yeah 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 um and so uh in a sense here blocked is a type of masked where all of right. the same type are massed together versus interleaved they're spaced in the sense that between every past simple there's a different category in this case the present perfect so there there is a not a time gap but a different uh item gap between right, each right, of right. them right, right yeah i think spaced and interleaved the difference is kind of clear um mm -hmm. but the difference between blocked and masked is the one that always kind of through me a little bit because it's like they both seem kind of blocked in a sense the mast is i guess mast doesn't have the is it fair to say mast doesn't have the variation or have i got that wrong i think um it, it's you can think of it in terms of time scale and the type of research so um for example like uh if you're familiar with the work of tetsuya nakata Okay. Mm. okay. Oh, okay. So he's a spacing research. He's a well. He's a typically a vocabulary researcher. He's based in Japan as well. He's done quite a few studies looking at spacing, in what's known as the, the researchers call it the within session paradigm. So it's how items can be ordered within a single study session. Okay. And this is uh, very much whether, for example. Um, you know, when you're learning uh, paired associates, so uh, like English, the L1 word cat, the L2 word uh, okay. kochka, if you're learning Czech, um, and then you have other items, whether you should practice this five times in a row or whether you should mix it up with the other items. Um, right. so, so blocked versus interleaved, um, it's a variant on spacing. I, I think long story short, it's just it's, it's just a way of uh, looking at spacing. OK, not necessarily with a time gap, but with uh, the gap is actually filled with different items. Right, 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 right. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, in, important thing, though, uh, to come back to uh, and uh, I'll give this question to you. Uh, no. So so imagine you had uh, the two worksheets. Uh, yeah. The one arranged in blocked format, so five present per five past simple, then five present perfect versus the interleaved. Right. Uh, all things being equal, which one would be easier for the students? I think that well, my guess would be that the blocked one would be easier because they're doing the same thing again and again. They're, they're doing the same type of thing again and again. But then, you know, on that point, e easiness, as we know doesn't necessarily translate into good learning. In fact, I think Willingham kind of makes the whole, that's the whole point of his book, that the opposite is the case, right? Like the difficulty, or at least, I guess, a level of um, effort makes things more memorable. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. No, no, then that was, that was kind of, yeah, what I was going to get at. It was um, very often we see that uh, a disconnect between performance and uh, later long-term retention. Right. So that's, that, that, that's something that's important in the literature on spacing as a whole. Um, in masked or blocked conditions, our performance during the activity right. can be inflated um, compared to the distributed or the spaced or interleaved condition. So actually performance during the activity, uh, masked might outperform it. But as time goes on, research suggests that the interleave better maintains uh, their gains uh, as opposed to mast, which is which drops. Yeah, this is something interesting, actually, because just on a side note, I wanted to bring this up and I'm glad you did, because um, I've heard a lot of people saying 
interleaved or spaced practice is better or you know interleaved practice is um is better and actually when you look at the research uh, even on um vocab or in other areas as you just said um that's not true for the short term like i mean that's a kind of key finding i think like the, the short term generally the blocked practice seems to produce better results um yes yeah yeah uh, and i think and this is something we can talk about later on with a number of the studies, the language learning studies. Um, cognitive psychologists are very critical of a number of studies in SLA. Oh, really? Uh, because we don't, a, lot, a number of them haven't used delayed post-tests. They've only used right. immediate post-tests. Right. Um, and this is argued to be stacking the deck uh, in favor of the uh, more masked conditions. Right. Right, yeah. very um, interesting. Well, let's get into that later. But um, uh, yeah, I think we've explained that, or you've explained the differences between the kind of four basic conditions. There are other conditions, I think, like the mm -hmm. amount of time. And I, I've even seen something called hybrid, which I don't think we should get into, but mm -hmm. uh, like a, a mixed approach. But anyway, my next question is kind of why why has this suddenly taken off as such a focus of research at the moment? Why have people become so interested in this? Or well, it seems to me recently, perhaps it's not recently, but there seems to be a lot of papers mm. the last 20 years or so. Uh, mm. Why has that, um, why do you, what's the explanation for that? Because I think you said in one of your papers that there was a call for, uh, I think Ellis made a call for people to research this area and nobody kind of took him up on it for a while. Yeah. So. Um... So taking a long view of the past 130 years, so um, back in the 70s, um, there in cog one of the cognitive psychologists started uh, complaining about um, this, uh, I don't know, waxing and waning of interest in spacing research. So over the past 130 years, what there has seemed to be are surges of interest in spacing across the literature, and then it dies down, and then it's rediscovered and Kind of it goes through cycles um taking the long view i think we're just at the peak of another right wa wave of interest in it um uh but um with regard to what's going on in the field i think it's related to a number of things um evidence-based practice uh there there's been i i would say a sustained interest in evidence-based practice over the past say 20 years or so and i think it's growing uh you know uh, your book, um, but also a number of cognitive psychologists, Willingham, um, yeah. and there's more, um, you know, who yeah. have talked about spacing effects, because it's, uh, it's an educational technique or intervention method, whatever you want to call it, where we actually do have empirical support. Right. Um, and so many things do not have empirical support that we do uh, in education. Yeah. Uh, and this is one of the um, areas that does. Um, so I think even like, I, I think like, you know, John Hattie, he has his famous visible learning. And um, in the original, you know, version of that, he listed space spacing as, one, as quite high, as very, right. having very large effect sizes, which I think is inflated, but that's besides the point. Um, so I think, it, I think it reflects just this general interest in evidence-based approaches to teaching. Um, and, um, and, you know, uh, again, a similar point to this is uh, spacing effects have been called one of the most, if not the most robu robust findings in all of the psychological yeah. literature. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, that it can replicate or reproduce, it's, it's one of the few interventions that actually uh, consistently does so. Yeah, yeah. In second language acquisition um, or language in language learning, there's been um, increased interest in instructed second language acquisition yeah. and also practice effects. Um, so the things we do in the classroom, um, how can we bring about learning games, you know, through the activities and other and tasks and so on that we do in the classroom. Um, and this is connected with that as well. Uh, and also theoretically, uh, this concept of desirable difficulties, right. um, you know, that uh, a little bit of challenge is good for learning and spacing has been argued to be one of the conditions that brings about a desirable difficulty. Uh, yeah. So studying things 
in one sitting, it, uh, it's more intensive, but it can feel easier because it's fresh in your memory. But if you leave, if you take a break and come back, you've forgotten some of it. So it's a little bit more challenging. So it, it creates a little bit of a challenge, which makes things more difficult at the time, but leads to more robust memory representations. Yeah. According to the theory. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, on a practical level, uh, I'm quite, uh, it appeals to me just because it's, um, it's a low cost intervention. Yeah. It doesn't require the teachers to do anything different. It's just instead of uh, doing it again now, let's wait a, wait a week and do it then. So uh, it doesn't actually require any training or any specialist equipment. Uh, just sure. in, in theory, wait a bit and then come back to it and it uh, should be more effective. Yeah, I think there was a paper actually, it might have been Willingham as well, which was called something like inexpensive interventions. And I think this was one of them. Yeah, so yeah, it's something as you say that you can just do. Um, without without uh, much change, and maybe you have to change the order of your worksheets. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, this is a it's widely it's widely talked about. Uh, I would say across the uh, I don't I don't I'm not sure how to, to describe it. The popular literature. Um, yeah. So yeah. so towards yeah. teaching and learning, um, and it yeah. seems to be widely propagated. Uh, yeah. Yeah. whether this is overstated or not. Uh, right. is... Well, yes, we want to get into that. We want to, we want to know, uh, and especially in, for, for, for EFL research. And that's, and that's, I guess you're the man to, to answer that. Um, so we, actually that's my next kind of question. So as we, as you've noted in mainstream education, so this is being, this is often touted, as you say, for, as being superior for retention, but how does, the research that we have to date in ELT or SLA kind of line up with with those findings. And, and actually, I suppose if while we're on this subject, how I mean, they're, as you as you've noted, they're called robust these findings in mainstream education. But are they as robust as people say, or are there problems with that, those as well? Y yes and no. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, what is robust? is when we compare, when we have an experiment that compares a masked condition versus a spaced condition. So when we have uh, one condition where it's studied without a break compared to studying it with a break, uh, the, the superiority of the distributed condition in this case, uh, this is a robust finding pretty much across the literature. Replicated. Yeah, yes, yeah, replicated many times. So for example, um, uh, Sapita et al, 2006 did a meta-analysis and they found more than 350 verbal learning studies wow. alone. So, you know, when you compare this, like in the field of second language acquisition, we'll have meta-analyses with like 15 studies in them. Right, and this right, is 350. Right. And it's, you know, it's a very robust finding with a lot of research um, that has been carried out. How do you even do a meta-analysis with just 350 studies? It's like years. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Basically, it's a whole doctoral project, I think, you know, okay. just to do that. Yeah. Um, so a psychologist named um, Doug Rohrer. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, so in 2015, he did a review paper where he uh, applied some different criteria that he called educational relevance. So one of uh, Rohrer's ideas, which I've also written about, is um, whether spacing is relevant to classroom learning. So his point is, when we teach in the classroom, uh, typically it's taught for the first time, and then the teacher comes back to it on another day and reviews it. Uh, his idea was, uh, rarely, if ever, does the teacher teach it and then immediately review it afterwards. Right. Right. Um, and so his point was, MAST is not necessarily educationally relevant. He says only uh, gaps of at least one day which would reflect the authentic learning environment where it's taught and then reviewed the next in class the next day. So he uh, went to the literature and he applied a, a screening criteria. And he said, okay, let's look at the studies that have compared two different spacing gaps, minimum of one day. Right. So for example, a one day gap versus a seven day gap. Uh, and then also have included a delayed post-test. So 
Uh, and he has a few more criteria, like it had to be published in a journal and so on. But the, ma the main criteria here are it compares two different spacing conditions of different lengths, uh, minimum one day gap uh, between the first study session and the second study session, and then uh, a minimum of one day before it's tested, right? Because again, these immediate tests are argued to stack the deck in favor of mass conditions. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier the meta-analysis by Sapita et al. found 350. Uh, Rohrer's study, I think he found uh, only nine of these. Oh, OK. Uh, met, met his criteria for educational relevance. Uh, so I think when people make the claim, spacing is one of these very robust findings that we should apply. They're looking at the 350 studies. Yeah. Uh, but we can argue that not all of these are necessarily relevant for real authentic teaching that happens in classrooms. Uh, and the number is far fewer. Right. This being said, much of the, uh, many of this, many if not all of the SLA studies since that time, since 2015, have met Rohrer's criteria. So I think the number has grown. It's much, it's much larger now. Um, but I guess my point with this is when we say it's a robust finding, um, it, this this could easily be argued to be overstated to some right. degree. Take yeah. it with a pinch of salt. Yes. Um, let's see. A lot of things like that in research where it kind of the the nuance gets bled out a little bit when it makes its way into 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 mainstream. Um, you know, when you're telling a mainstream audience, there's a there's a kind of limit to what you can go into. So yeah, I mean, it's it, that kind of leeches out i guess the, the detail but that's very interesting that's very interesting to know um yeah. yeah but i think uh you know one thing to keep in mind is for many teachers when i say you know we should be reviewing i think this is clear like coming back to the material at a labor later time uh no matter when you do it is a good thing yeah a lot of teachers when i say this they go yeah of course um, but it's important to keep in mind in some context this actually doesn't happen um, well, whether because of crowded curriculum or for whatever reason. I would argue it doesn't happen at all. I mean, one of the related concepts is um, uh, retrieval practice, hmm. which I suppose can be used with um, spacing. Hmm. But um, I, I have observed a number of teachers um, teach uh, in my previous job, and I... I mean, maybe you could put the, make the excuse that it was because it was an observation and observations are in a sense, very contained things which have a kind of start and a finish. But I only ever once I think saw a teacher do review um, at the start of the class. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they were reviewing material from another day, but review, I, I don't know how, people might say, yeah, of course we do review. I'm not convinced necessarily that people do do that much review. Um, so. You know, it's uh, it's tricky with language classes because the classes do build upon each other. Yeah. And in theory, the vocabulary that is learned is recycled. For example, in the readings and the listenings, um, I, I'd like I, I would like to think so that the whatever materials they're using have been designed in this way. Right. Um, but. Uh, Yes. Um, so, and I think an interesting point is when we look at the methodology of spacing studies, typical spacing studies uh, that have looked at over longer periods of time with a time gap, they have a list. Uh, most of the studies have involved um, vocabulary, as you mentioned. Right. Uh, very often things like um, English, Swahili word pairs. Right, 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 right. You know? uh, and in the first session, in the first study session, the entire list is learned. And then in the second session, the entire list is reviewed. Does this transfer to foreign language classrooms? Well, at the, the first class of the semester, the teacher doesn't teach all of the vocabulary words that are gonna be tested at the end of the year exam, right? So there's a subset and then later this is hopefully reviewed, but it's built upon as the semester goes along. Uh, so there, there are some challenges. Um, yeah. Basically, the, you know, the design of spacing studies doesn't, you know, we, we can discuss the degree that it actually reflects what happens in classrooms um, yeah. for, across a number of different variables. 
So is this is this what's meant by the term? I might be getting I might be embarrassing myself here, but um, ecological validity that the research is not necessarily always applicable to classrooms. Yeah, I would exactly. Um, so ecological validity, it's a form of external validity. Does it reflect the reality of what happens in a classroom? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, okay. and th this is something I, you know, I, I push for. It's uh, if we want to say, as researchers, if we want to say our research carried out in the lab generalizes to, you know, real teaching environments, then it, it should reflect the realities in some, in some, in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and then uh, my my second point is: Does it um, is an extensive spaced instruction beneficial for language learning? It's important to acknowledge from the broader second language acquisition literature, we have a good deal of evidence that intensive instruction is beneficial. Right. To phrase this in a different way, um, to use a double negative, uh, I don't actually know of any evidence that intensive instruction is not effective. All right, so just the same, same idea. Uh, so we have lots of evidence in favor of intensive instruction. When you say intensive instruction, you mean that, the, that you would do 21 hours of instruction over a week rather than doing, um, I don't know, 11 hours over two weeks that's is that what we're talking about exactly or um two hours a week over a period of 10 weeks so i'm thinking about these um uh they're, they're sometimes referred to as curricular studies right in sla um, and i'm thinking of the studies that were carried out in uh canada so lightbound spada laura collins joanna white and colleagues where they compared uh for example the traditional language instruction in which students have two, two or four hours of lessons a week over the full academic year versus having just an immersion environment where they're exposed to the target language for 20 or 40 hours a week over a shorter period of time. So this is the intensive, just very uh, almost an immersion environment. Um, these studies have been very consistent in showing advantages for intensive instruction, not just in Canada, but also the studies from Spain, like Raquel Serrano and Carlin, uh, Carmen Munoz right. have also done some research there. Yeah. Um, and again, there, um, the intensive conditions, again, comparing the different curriculum uh, have shown advantages for intensive over extensive. These studies, again, are criticized because they tend to measure learning just at the end of the semester or when right. instruction finishes. So again, there's no delayed post-test. Uh, and from the cognitive psychology point of view, uh, there's the what if, like what if they had measured learning later, would the results have been the same? Sure, sure. Were, were there none, were there none that, um, I mean, <clears throat> I don't wanna put you on the spot, but um, were, there, were there any that did the kind of intensive, um, intensive course treatment and, and then measured like a delayed? There has been, um, yeah, there has been one. Oh, wow. the yeah, but the challenge here is we're, we're collecting data in the real world. Right, right, right. The learners just don't stop their studies. So it's impossible to say um, whether the observed changes are due to the original training or if it's due to what they've been doing since then. Right. So we can't like in terms of experimental control, like isolate that variable. So it, it's really. Um, it's not going to satisfy the experimental researchers. Um, sure. Uh, but the one study, uh, and I can't remember the name, I wanna say it's by Laura Collins and colleagues, but I can't remember the year. They did trace some learners over a longer period of time and the, the learners in the original intensive conditions were still uh, at an advantage over the more extensive at a later date. Um, again, that's one study. Um, but um, I think it's also important to say that the reason they were carrying out this research was that the extensive conditions were the norm at the time in many of these contexts, and the outcomes were just not good. Uh, so, so, so it was not the case that the um, 
extensive conditions were leading to really good learning outcomes or really superior learning outcomes later down the road. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, those learners were underperforming. It's something I think that most teachers or, or yeah, I think certainly most language teachers will certainly not have to be very persuaded of. I think they'll feel like that's kind of a, uh, a, a finding they can get on board with because we've all had experiences of teaching, you know, summer courses or intensive courses. And at the same time, the student who comes once a week for one hour. And it's easy to feel like the student who comes once a week for one hour never makes any progress because they, they seem to have forgotten everything by the time the class comes around again. So it does seem like a kind of very intuitive um, finding there, but it does kind of go, as you say, it does go against the idea of, um, of blocked and uh, and spaced practice results. Yes, yeah, and I think, um, and we can relate this to you know the nature of language learning. So you know, obviously, learning the uh, L one L two semantic meaning of words that's part of language learning, but it's not the whole picture. Um, so, for example, grammar learning. Um, you know, right. it's not it's not just learning. Um, uh, the exemplars, but it's uh, learning. It's learning to abstract this underlying grammar across different exemplars. Um, so it's an abstract understanding of the underlying grammar and applying it to new contexts, rather than just uh, regurgitating or just re remembering what the uh, the word is based on the L one. So remembering kochka means cat. It's actually using it in new contexts. Yeah. And can we talk a little bit now about? Um, grammar, because that's uh, something I'd quite like to get on to with you. Yes. Uh, uh, so um, uh, grammar learning. OK, so um, there have been studies in yeah. uh, language learning that have looked at the learning of grammar, um, comparing um, masked versus spaced or um, different spacing lengths. So for example, probably the most famous SLA study is Steve Bird, 2010. Right. Um, and he compared, um, he was looking at learning of uh, grammar. Uh, and I believe one condition had a three day gap between the training sessions and the other condition had 14 day, if my memory is right. Um, and he compared these two. Similarly, uh, I had a study that compared uh, like a two day gap versus a seven day gap. Um, Scott Miles has a study where he looked at a mast versus two different space conditions and I can't remember. Um, yeah, forgive me, Scott, if you are watching. Yeah, but I can't remember exactly what the different spacing schedules were, but he had two different spacing schedules and so on. Uh, and then Suzuki as well has um, done some studies, um, Yuichi yes. Suzuki, um, and he has looked at grammar learning and he's also looked at fluency development, which I'll, I'll talk about later on. Um, these studies have been mixed, yes. um, the, re the results. Um, and um, there's a few different reasons why I think this might be the case. Um, one, it's the nature of grammar learning might just be different than vocabulary learning, simple, explanation. Another is methodological. Uh, so studies in cognitive psychology, the very good robust studies, do not just compare two different space schedules. They'll compare a number of different schedules, like very kind of, um, so for example, uh, Sapita et al., uh, so that um, 2009, uh, they compared uh, MAST versus one day between study, two day, a four day, a seven day, and a 14 day. So they had a, a good range of different spacing conditions. Um, and the reason for this is if one of the spacing conditions is superior, you can kind of see it in when you uh, plot the data, right? So you can see performance go up and then go back down. So for example, if the four day condition was the best, it should rise and then fall. SLA studies like my own, um, two day condition versus a seven day condition. Uh, for me, the seven day condition showed better results. And at the time, um, in my naivety, I said it's uh, evidence that uh, more extended, more uh, extensive conditions or spaced conditions might be beneficial for L2 learning. But you can play the what if game. 
what if instead of two day versus seven day, I had compared seven day versus 14 day? Right. If the seven day had still been superior, well, then my conclusion would have actually been the opposite. It would have been more intensive is more beneficial. So um, I criticize this. I criticize myself in second language acquisition has taken a piecemeal approach. Sometimes our spacing conditions um, are justified by the context that we're collecting data in. So we're collecting data in the classroom. In my case, the classes met every two days. So I, it kind of just, uh, it, it fit in. Uh, it was a matter of convenience um, and also ecological validity why I chose them. Sometimes we don't justify them. Um, so in this case, uh, just when you look at individual studies, they have different treatments. They're looking at the learning of different areas of grammar. Um, the methods they're using to study and review are different. And you know, language learning is complex. What you're learning, how you're trying to learn it, and also possibly spacing all uh, interact you know, to influence learning. So uh, it's, you know, it, it's really difficult to come to a conclusion from the SLA studies that have looked at grammar learning. Yeah, it's fascinating what you said about the, the just the perception of, of um, yeah, the time difference. I hadn't thought about that. And that's, um, that's a really interesting take. So just to kind of, I just want to clarify. So with your study, uh, 2015 and, and Miles and Bird, they were looking at um, different intervals, but not looking at kind of um, mast versus uh, spaced or, or were they? Uh, Bird and myself, we were looking at different intervals. Uh, I believe Miles did have a mast condition. And okay. I, think, I think Miles did show differences between the mast condition versus the spaced conditions. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is consistent with the finding from cognitive psychology, which tends to show advantages for spaced conditions over mast condition. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, the Sapita et al. study I just mentioned, which compared all of the different um, or the range of different uh, time gaps, they found that all of the space conditions outperformed the mass oh, condition. Interesting. But there was no significant difference between the space conditions. Oh. Right. Um, I actually, with uh, some colleagues, just replicated this study um, in an online environment. So they collected it in a language lab. Uh, I've become interested in data collection online, so running the full experiments you know, um, via web server. Um, and we found um, similar a similar pattern to the results. Oh, interesting. Was um, that for grammar? This was vocabulary learning. Oh, okay. vocabulary learning, yeah. But, but I think, uh, you know, the miles, uh, it does suggest, you know, if the grammar learning studies are comparing masked, a real, ma a true masked condition versus spaced, we are likely to seal the to see advantages for the spaced conditions over the mast, so, uh, in my opinion. Okay, my reading of the research, and I don't know if mm -hmm. now this might be wrong, was that when, when I was looking at the different conclusions for grammar, um, was that some studies were coming, quite a few studies were coming out saying like either neither, um, neither approach particularly had um, much of a difference or, or both were as good as each other. And then others were saying the interleaved spaced or distributed practice were um, were better, but I think only I only saw one, which was uh, Suzuki 2017, which seemed to favor blocking over um, spacing. I'm not sure if I if I've got that right, but it did seem like the, the results were coming out either to say not much difference or spacing was a little bit better. Is that how you read it or am I misunderstanding? Uh, I think, well, okay. So first, um, when we compare blocked versus interleaved, I, I believe these results are a little bit uh, more consistent right. in terms of grammar learning um, in that interleaving does seem to promote the learning of grammar. Right. If I can try to explain this, uh, blocked is very much like a true mast condition, and we're comparing it against a space condition. And when you compare a true mast condition versus a spaced condition, it seems the space condition usually wins. Right. Right. Um, 
with uh, Suzuki, uh, and, um, and Suzuki has a new paper out uh, mm -hmm. in language learning where the blocked condition actually outperforms the interleaved condition. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, I think wow. we have for um, no, this one was for fluency development. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I think we have to. Um, Another thing we have to consider is the nature of the knowledge that's being developed. Right. So uh, we typically differentiate. In SLA, we've had an interest in what's known as explicit versus implicit knowledge. Um, and sometimes we can refer to it as declarative versus procedural. Um, there are some differences here. And you know the, the researchers will get into an argument. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider them the same here. Right, even okay. the researchers, there, there's slight differences between them. Yeah. So explicit or declarative knowledge is typically knowledge um, knowledge that. So it tends to be associated with factual knowledge. Um, and uh, procedural knowledge is knowledge how. So it's actually the skill of how to use it. So the, the factual knowledge would be knowledge such as um, you use, it could be metalinguistic knowledge. Uh, when you have an unspecified time in the past, you should use the present perfect rather than past simple. Um, and then the procedural knowledge is the ability to actually use the present perfect in spontaneous speech. Beginning language learners tend to have more of the declarative knowledge. They might know the metalinguistic rule. Mm. And I think any of us who've learned a language at the beginning, you have to do a lot of thinking, putting the verb in the correct form, you know, to build the sentence, it actually requires a lot of thought and takes some time. More advanced learners, they can just make the sentence, right? They don't need to stop and think, I need the present perfect here. In theory, they can just do it. Uh, and so this uh, procedural or implicit knowledge, it's argued to be tacit or unconscious, like we can, or automatic, we can just do it automatically. Okay. Uh, and this automaticity is associated, uh, language teachers will be familiar with the concept of fluency, right? Mm -hmm. Building fluency is in mm -hmm. fact, the transition from more declarative to more procedural or automatic. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, um, is space practice beneficial for declarative and procedural? Is it beneficial for just declarative or just, you know, Basically, how does it affect language development? Because language development involves both, but uh, moving forward is actually the proceduralization is the important process. Right. So what, what's being measured? Yes, what's being measured. So Suzuki, in a lot of his work, uh, is looking at fluency development. Uh, so Yuichi Suzuki, he's very interested in skill acquisition frameworks uh, and this process of becoming more, uh, of, of your language use becoming more automatized. We have evidence from him across a number of studies that masked or blocked practice might be more beneficial for fluency development. Mm. <clears throat> Whereas the uh, extensive might be more beneficial for the initial declarative, like learning the words in the first instance, but then actually learning to use them automatically uh, benefits from more intensive instruction. Interesting. Similarly, um, Nakata and Elgort in a recent study, they used different measures of knowledge. So they had a, a it was a vocabulary learning study, and they looked at um, tests that measured declarative knowledge and tests that measured procedural knowledge. And they found um, that the uh, distributed conditions led to more declarative knowledge, right. but the mass conditions led to more procedural knowledge, Very this implicit. Very interesting. So, um, you know, is it uh, straightforward, massed or distributed, which is best for language learning? Uh, no. No. Um, it, it's going to depend on what we're looking at, what we're measuring. Um, and it's likely some combination of both. Right, right. Are gonna be, is going to be beneficial. Yeah, my, my, I think it, Ben Goldacre wrote a book uh, about um, uh, evidence-based medicine, but the title was something, um, something like, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that, uh, which seems to be always the kind of uh, the, the ultimate finding of research. Uh, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated. Than that. Yeah, yeah, which, which is why it's interesting. And, and these are actually the, you know, very interesting findings. Um, mm. Because in effect, some of these findings are going in the opposite direction. Yes. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. 
yes. so uh, yeah. and also another consideration for me was how <clears throat> how the how the grammatical findings i mean i, I guess they're kind of mixed as, as you've said but uh, the ones that found a kind of um, advantage for interleaved or spaced uh, practice how they lined up with the ideas of like the teachability of uh, of grammar and uh, the notions of like uh, some kind of cognitive uh, limits or hard limits on learnability or I suppose teachability and if you're seeing a an alteration or a change in the in the speed or the or the ability that with which students retain the information then there would be questions there I suppose I think you're right. I think there's going to be there will be interactions between um, you know learner individual differences. Um, you know, certainly uh, you know you mentioned teachability or um, you know are the learners developmentally ready yeah. uh, to learn the particular grammar and so on. Because the, uh, the fundamental part of that developmental readiness, uh, I mean, my understanding might not be perfect, but it's kind of like the the, the students will only acquire the forms when they are developmentally ready and so if you're if you've got two grammatical uh, treatments and you're finding that one of them is leading to faster development well something is amiss there in a sense like uh, something is why is it overriding the developmental readiness or is it is it something else that's going on uh, that's kind of interesting for me I, uh, so in many studies uh one of my criticism as a researcher is based on the results of the post-test they make assumptions about the actual process of learning. Right. Um, so, and there's many reasons why one treatment might be more effective than another. It might be attentional processes. So we know increased attention is associated with better learning outcomes. So maybe uh, in this instance, uh, treatment number two led to more, the learners paying more attention and noticing more. Um, it might be due to desirable difficulties, so it created a little bit more challenge. Um, you know, you can link it to different theoretical frameworks um, quite easily. But uh, a criticism is this is an assumption. We're making an assumption of, about the training phase based on the result. Uh, and uh, we need more studies that look at the process of learning and the product. So to, to try to tease out what is it that's actually happening during the, the treatment that's leading to the observable differences. Right, right. Wow, a lot to think about there. Um, yeah. So is there anything that you think that we've missed? Um, so I, I do want to say, I, I do want to plug, uh, I think um, for, right. re for researchers, uh, we need more research. Uh, we need replications yeah. and reproductions of previous research. To my knowledge, there have, uh, so there have been a handful of studies that have shown uh, benefits for distributed practice with regard to grammar learning. But the ones that have shown these benefits, I am not aware of a single published replication of any of these. Oh, interesting. Whereas the studies that have not shown these differences uh, have replicated and ha or the or replications have been published. So uh, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence, but uh, we, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have replications of these studies that have shown differences, my, my own included. Um, the curricular level studies, of which there have been, uh, there have been several, um, but they have been in two contexts. They've been in Canada, they've been in Spain. Um, these studies are very robust, and I, you know, I, I very much admire these researchers as well. They're some of my heroes in the field. Um, so don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing them, but um, context is important. Do these studies necessarily replicate to other teaching and learning contexts? Mm. Um, so if someone could do a similar study, you know, in, in the Asian context, if they had the connections to set that up, that would be hugely valuable. Um, and we need more, uh, yeah, I, I think this is a, a growing area within SLA. Yes. So I, I think... Um, and I think what's promising is researchers have started looking at spacing as a moderating variable. So task repetition researchers have also started to look to see if uh, spacing moderates the effects of task repetition. And I think this is important in other areas. So for example, corrective feedback. Does okay. the spacing of corrective feedback make a difference? 
um, yeah, yeah. and so on. You know? um, and so I think there's lots of room uh, to try to figure these things out. Yeah, this bit, yeah, I, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, and it would be good to find out more about that. So just to finish uh, with, um, <clears throat> Is there a kind of, do you think there's a kind of, I mean, you used to be a teacher yourself. I think you still are a teacher, but perhaps more of a um, lecturer than a, than a language teacher. I don't know, do you still do any language teaching? Uh, nowadays, no, no, no. no. Um, some people kind of still like to do a class now and again, I think. Mm. Um, what would you say are the kind of main takeaways for, um, I'm kind of springing this question on you, sorry mm. about that, but, uh, what, what, what would you say are the main takeaways of the research for, um, for teachers? Is it just a case of making sure that they, um, you know, they, they revise stuff with the students as they should and they recycle stuff into the materials or, or do you think there's kind of a, a, a different message? So, so I think um, first, uh, with regard to intensive language study, um, so this is out of the hands of many teachers, right? They they get assigned their courses. They don't they don't decide how often or the intensity with which their courses meet. But I think um, encourage the students uh, as much as possible if they have the opportunity to do an intensive language course. Right. Um, encourage students to do this. If you're if you're studying a language, seek out these opportunities. Um, we have evidence that this is beneficial. With regard to the spacing in your own classes. It, it's challenging, um, you know, to have a system, uh, you know, to, where you systematically review material, but it's beneficial. So I think it's important to, however the best you can, I'm being very uh, generous here, however the best you're able to do so, right. re revisit and review um, during the year. Uh, pre or previously taught grammar, previously taught vocabulary, and also previously taught activities. There's no harm in doing activities again that the students have already done. Right. Um, teachers, myself included, uh, I would always try to come up with something new out of the fear that my students will feel bored. Um, yeah. But the task repetition literature, which this is all it investigates, repeating you know, tasks again, uh, it's quite clear that students appreciate these opportunities to do things again. So don't be afraid. I would say if you have a nice speaking activity with the students, um, wait a few weeks, ask them to do it again if you have time. There's no harm in this whatsoever. Yeah, I absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And as a, as a language student, I think as a teacher, you're absolutely right. I'm, I do a speaking activity at the end of class or something, and I'll feel like, oh, I I've got a bit of extra time, but I can't do it again because it would be, that would be um, criminal almost. But uh, as a student, um, as a language student, I realize like the amount of repetition I need is um, huge. And I, and I just want to keep doing the same thing again until I get it right almost. Uh, so, yeah. And, and until you get it right, obviously at a certain point, there's going to be diminishing returns, right? right. right? But, but I mean, you know, uh, yeah, I think doing activities again is very worthwhile Absolutely. and has benefits. Um, and, you know, in the um, common literature, like the vocabulary learning researchers, they talk about like expanding. So reviewing after one day and then after four days and then after right. 10 days. So the forgetting curve. Yes, this has not uh, been borne out in the literature at all. Oh, really? Not at all. Um, so um, there, there are clear advantages of spacing. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to matter how whether you have equal gaps or expanding gaps. Uh, there, there's actually a meta analysis has just come out, you know, where wow. they just said there's there's not consistent evidence for this. So I would say um, logically and intuitively, expanding should be better. Yeah, yeah, but uh, we don't have any evidence for this. So I would say uh, my advice for teachers would be. Um, systematically review. Um, I wouldn't invest too much time and energy in, for example, structuring it where it slowly expands. If you want to do it, go for it. But uh, I, I don't, not sure if it'll be, it's, it's worth the effort. It's a good um, point, actually, because, you yeah. know, you've got these teachers kind of calculating how many days after, you know, how many days after I have to do this again. It doesn't make much practical sense. 
yeah so 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 if i was a teacher um i would probably try maybe just a weekly approach or something of this nature just just have some kind of system or every two weeks just right. uh you know look back two weeks what did i do and try to incorporate that into this lesson somehow um and then on a practical level uh, reviewing just before it's measured is hugely beneficial <laughs> right so so like if the goal if one of the goals is for them to perform well on the assessment a review close to the assessment uh is very beneficial um yeah. massing almost yeah massing yeah, yeah so so i think we all remember being students and cramming for the exam uh cramming works for short-term retention yeah. so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, combine with two. Okay, that was fantastic. Um, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming along to talk to you. That was really interesting. And um, perhaps when you do write the book, hmm. uh, you can come back and uh, tell us a little bit about it. Any idea when it will be out? Uh, well, I'm, it's under contract. So hopefully to finish within the next, say, six to nine months. And then I don't yeah. envy you <laughs> having just finished yeah. the book. Well, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the, you know, academic career where you have more writing projects than you have time for. So as you know, wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And also I wanted to say, uh, I, I very much appreciate the work that you're doing with the evidence-based practice. Um, Thanks. Thank you. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, the learning styles article in IRAL, uh, was, you know, very good. And, uh, yeah, yeah even though learning styles is never going away. No. Oh. It's not, it's not, or something else will come to. Yeah, actually, I just got, I'm going to write a tweet about this, but um, I just got the fifth edition of um, uh, How Languages Are Learned, um, which is always talked about learning styles, the, the, the third edition, the fourth edition, the fifth mm. edition, and they've left the chapter exactly the same, except uh, you know, saying learning styles is, shows us this and shows us that and shows us the other. And they've just inserted a kind of sentence which says um, there isn't, really any research that supports learning styles. And they've inserted this sentence, which is great, but the chapter remains the same uh, from the fourth edition and the third edition. So you're right, it's, it's, it's never going away. Uh, but, but also, you know, part of it is, um, it, it's not a learning style, it's a learning preference, right? And so, uh, you know, and I used to teach in like language schools, you know, or like, you know, like private language institutes. And part of the job is keeping the students happy. Mm. You yeah. Know, so catering to what the students want. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, preferences, you know, I think everybody has preferences, but I, it's just, the problem is when it becomes. Well, it doesn't mean it's good for you, you know. Yeah. It, the problem is when it becomes operationalized into kind of mm. like if you deliver you have to deliver methods in this particular way for optimal results and it, it just doesn't it just doesn't seem to be borne out i mean as always and i've said this from the start i think um if somebody publishes a paper tomorrow which shows you know when you give aud auditory learners vocab uh, through audiobooks their results uh, six significantly improve then i will be a convert overnight uh, if it replicates, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and this is another danger. Like, you know, you get one sensational headline and people grab onto it. And yeah. 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 Well, the research is getting a lot better and the replication thing is really coming to the forefront. Um, I think Marsden, I can't remember who her co author was, um, wrote a very I think a kind of groundbreaking paper on replication and it's really been something that's that's being pushed these days um, i think so. yes yeah, so, well i mean it, especially you know psychology um the you've probably read that you know the nudge literature um yes. and you know it's basically falling apart and there have been some high pro profile cases of fraud recently yeah i'm very well. tempted to blog about it actually but um it's just finding the time but yeah i'm very i'm very interested in in that because um we're going very off topic here but it, are you okay for time yeah, yeah yeah i got a few minutes no problem yeah. the, the, the thing that i find fascinating is people will say oh there's a replication crisis in psychology and um uh they had a hundred top studies which is an amazing piece of research by the way um mm -hmm. you know they, i think they looked at a hundred studies and and kind of 30 percent of them replicated very solidly there were other very you you know all this i'm not telling you anything you don't know but um the thing that always makes me laugh is you know you couldn't do that 
uh, in SLA because there are no, there are basically no replications to, to, um, to, to even check um, whether this stuff replicates. It's, it's, there's so little replication done in SLA. Yes. Yeah. I think it's changing. Yes. Um, it's you know, um, you know, like SSLA um, and other journals, they have sections just for replication studies okay. now. You know, so, uh, you know, but Luke Plonsky's over at SSLA yes. now. So he's, you know, he's a, a figurehead um, in this area. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Did you read, um, so, you know, like the work of uh, like Pashler and Rohrer because of their learning styles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you read their, their uh, paper on catching the academic fraud? I didn't, I didn't. Nice. So uh, basically they've got a... Um, if, if you go to go to Doug Rohr's like Florida website, you can find it. Um, so it was a researcher named something like Chatterjee, Chatterjee. And they published some absurd finding where it was in the like implicit, that implicit area of the nudge literature, which typically sees very small effect sizes. Priming stuff, is it? Yeah, priming. Yeah, yeah. And they published a study with just this gigantic effect size. And of course, oh. Pashler... And it got Pashler and all of those, you know, really superstars attention and they kind of started investigating and they've, they published a couple of papers just about their investigation into it and conclusion that it's just uh, blatantly made up. Well, I mean, I, I wrote, I don't know if you read um, Stuart Ritchie's book on science fictions, which is basically all about this. It's a fascinating book, but I wrote a blog post afterwards about um, um, basically about um, when papers get uh, retracted, so retraction in ELT, mm. uh, because this was all about, you know, these priming papers and things were retracted and often not just kind of, we're not talking about um, p-hacking, but actual fraud. Mm. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of that, but I, I looked through the SLA literature and one of the points I made in the blog post was um, there's almost no retraction in SLA. And I think Stuart Ritchie kind of says, you know, in psychology, maybe 5% of papers are completely fraudulent or, or something like that. And you know, that's how many that's been retracted. I can't remember the exact figure, but the fact that there's almost no retraction in SLA means one of two things. Um, and, hmm. you know, neither of those conclusions are particularly, um, both of them are quite worrying, shall we say. Well, I suppose everybody in SLA is very honest or, something else is going on. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we'll see it more in the coming years because data sharing is becoming more commonplace. So, cause in the past you just couldn't get access to data. I, you know, back in the day when I was a younger graduate student I would ask um, some well-known people for materials or data and just get told no. Right, yeah, you can't really do that so much anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, nowadays, um, and even recently, like uh, I got an email uh, from someone who was looking at my paper and they picked up a typo in one of the tables um, and, you know, uh, you know, and wrote me and I kind of just went, oh, here's the data. Like just do with it what you will. I'm, I'm like worried where this, what this might snowball into. So just yeah, here are the data. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that really interested me in the Ritchie book was um, there's a way of doing that. If you're, if you're mathematically kind of, if, you, if you're very good with stats, hmm. there's apparently a way of, of analyzing. Um, so if someone has used a, a Likert scale, a five point Likert scale, there's only certain numbers that can possibly come out. So if you, if you have the number of participants and the five part, part scale, you can only get certain numbers apparently. And one, one person has kind of gone, gone around and, um, and basically found fraud in papers by just calculating that the numbers can't possibly have existed. And I think like SLA, um, people aren't, I mean, Luke Plonsky is an exception, I think, because I think he does know his stats, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. how statistically competent that many people are. Like, I, I'm not, mm -hmm. I, I'm hopeless. Um, and it's difficult. So if somebody came along with a good knowledge of stats, I wonder if they would possibly discover some things. Yes, I, and I think um, uh, it's tricky. I think the, the younger generation are much stronger with stats. Like uh, out of the, you know, the, the strong SLA programs like Michigan State, right. Georgetown, like they're, 
you know, the young researchers coming out of those programs are very strong and very knowledgeable with stats because they have better training. But in general, psychology gives their graduate students much more extensive training in statistical methods than we do. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, like, how much fraud is there? Um, yeah, it's hard you to know, say. You, you, hope, you hope none. Yeah. Uh, and, but but I, I'm sure there are some instances, but like within the broader literature, like, like say the interaction literature, there's been so much research done that even if one or two are fraudulent mm. in there, you know, still the body of literature is still moving in the right direction. So I think like replication and, you know, trying to reproduce findings in new contexts, I think this is, uh, this is the way I would go um, rather than trying to hunt down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sure everybody in SLA is very honest. I'm sure it's just. A... Yeah. I mean, I mean, but then again, you know, I I have been asked to review papers where I've where I've raised concerns with the editor before. Oh, really? Yeah. Where I just said, you know, this. Uh, I'm not a statistician. I, like, I won't make accusations, but I'll say this looks a little fishy. I would. I would ask someone to check it out. Who knows what they're doing? Right. Right. You know. Well, but I mean. And people do make mistakes, like human error. Of course. Yeah. 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 I mean. Um, you know, with the Likert scale, I mean, you know, you know, it, it could just be, you know, your, you know, a typo, a type mistake. And there have been instances, I saw one on Twitter where someone in psychology got flagged on the Twitter page because all of their standard deviations were impossible. Oh. And then uh, it turns out that it was like a copy paste error where they did the standard error rather than standard deviation. And the authors immediately retracted the paper. Wow. on their own like uh just kind of took the extreme measure and wow well that's very good of them i mean very good of them um but or they issued a correction i'm not sure maybe not retracted maybe they just issued a correction but you know the authors just admitted the mistake and no okay. but uh but yeah but it's it's uh you know it's something to keep in mind when you publish an empirical study that it's possible someone's going to be going through your numbers with a yeah you know make sure you're not uh, making a copy paste error because very easy um, to do. Yeah. No. Um, no. Anyway, um, thank you again very much for this chat. Um, it's been really interesting. And um, yeah, come back again when you've uh, got the book out. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Russ. I enjoyed it. Uh, it's an opportunity to talk about, you know, something I'm interested in for, or to have a rant about something I'm interested in.